Early childhood history. When does the history of early childhood really begin? Why is it important that you know some of this history? Any historian will tell you that we can learn some very valuable lessons from our past. History allows us to better understand how we got to the present moment. We are not born with child development knowledge. Most of what we know about a child's development has evolved over time. The people you will be introduced to in this presentation are important to our profession because of their commitment to young children. When does, history, when does the history of early childhood really begin? As far back as 350 BC. Plato's laws and Aristotle's politics both made note of developmental characteristics and caretaking demands related to them. Plato comments on swaddling, rocking, and cooing to infants. He notes how important the formation of character is in these early years and emphasizes that children need protection from pain, fear, grief, and corruption. Aristotle's advice is even more detailed. He felt infants and toddlers should have free use of their limbs and become acclimated to the cold very early. He also stressed that babies be given plenty of milk. Now remember, wine was an acceptable substitute back then because it was a whole lot easier to get wine than it was now. That these two gentlemen even thought of childhood as a separate stage is absolutely amazing. Not much is recorded concerning young children until the 15th century. Martin Luther and Erasmus, both theologians, attempted to promote early childhood education. Martin Luther was the first theologian to suggest that everyone should be able to read God's word. Back in those days, only priests and very wealthy people could read. Martin Luther discovered it was very easy to teach young children, this meaning a child about the age of seven. It was very easy to teach this age child to learn learn to read. Erasmus also had some revolutionary ideas for his day. Now remember, religion back in the 15th century was hell, fire, and brimstone. So Erasmus felt that children were born good and should be valued for their hope of the future. This was a novel concept hundreds of years ago. Childhood was not a pleasant experience back then. Children pretty much took care of themselves. The centuries from the 14th to the 17th century were very long years of major political, economic, and religious transition in Europe and in America. It's almost impossible to find pictures of children during this time frame. A few scholars tried to keep the concept of early childhood alive. John Cominius kept Martin Luther's ideas alive. He kept stressing to anyone that would listen that he believed that young children's minds were moldable. Like Martin Luther, he kept repeating, if we educate children when they are young, our hope for the future will be better. John Cominius also can be credited with writing the very first children's book. Now, it was in Latin, but the thought was still there that children need their own literature. John Gutenberg exerted more influence than any of the people discussed up to this point. Many of you have studied about the printing press. It was John Gutenberg that accomplished this memento monumental task and printed the Bible as his first mission. History books will tell you that this changed the world. Some people are saying that about the internet in our age. Allowing more people access to the written word is very important and can cause great change. It wasn't until 1693 when a man by the name of John Locke published an article entitled Some Thoughts Concerning Education that the field of early childhood, actually education in general, was off and running. His article was filled with detailed advice on the physical and psychological training of children. How did John Locke come to know so much about children? Historical writings indicate that he appointed himself guardian of all his friend's children, and he hired himself as a tutor to more closely work and observe these fascinating little creatures. Most of what he advocated is accepted as common sense when we think of young children today. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a French political philosopher. He became a more controversial figure than, than Locke. Rousseau was very concerned about the balance of freedom and authority, as well as all the potential evil supposedly inherent in a child's natural impulses. He, though, like many of his predecessors, firmly believed that children were born good. 
this is still a revolutionary theory because it went totally against the religious beliefs of the age person was born into sin they must repent be saved redeemed and spend one's life paying penance rousseau felt that children were interactive products of their very own impulses and environmental de demands a very controversial theory but hold it in mind because we will encounter it again rousseau had many followers pestalozzi was a teacher and translated many of rousseau's theories into educational practice rousseau wrote that children were not capable of true formal reasoning until age twelve so pestaloni advocated that children not start any formal education until the age of twelve his idea was about as well accepted as it would be today imagine children not starting school until age twelve frederick froebel followed in the footsteps of rousseau and pestalozzi froebel was a teacher and very practical about life and children he thought play was the very essence of childhood so why not let children play in school voila kindergarten was born for those of you familiar with the german language kindergarten is translated into children's garden Charles Darwin is most noted for his publication, Origin of the Species, and his Darwinian Theory. To those of us in the early childhood field, he should re be remembered as a very astute observer of young children. He followed and recorded his own son's development. He was, of the, he was one of the first people to make note of infant reflexes. He was trying to provide data for his theory of evolution, but his publications in 1877 of his observations on children began to validate the field of research dealing, dealing with children by the late 1800s there are numerous manuals and journals on childhood and home life g stanley hall returns from graduate study in europe in which he opened the field of early childhood research in america at that time we will soon discover unless it's documented 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 it's really not research. Dr. Hall returned from his European studies with a newly devised questionnaire method. His object with this stack of papers was to investigate the content of children's minds. Hall's questionnaire had formed a basis for many of the aptitude tests that we still use today. Many of the later theorists we will talk about were his students at Hopkins University. It was G. Stanley Hall that introduced Sigmund Freud to America. What do you remember about Sigmund Freud? Many of Dr. Freud's are highly disputed today, but Dr. Sigmund did the field of early childhood a great service. He was a loud advocate for the pleasure-pain theory. This became known as the theory of psychosexual development or psychoanalytical theory. This theory maintains that from the earliest infant infancy, we are motivated by powerful instincts to seek pleasure and that different ages different parts of our body become the focus of pleasure he also proposed that a child's growth occurs in biologically determined state stages which was a very new concept back then he also advocated attachment theory babies need people they can depend on that will love them unconditionally that will take care of them he was totally against letting the child cry themselves to sleep. Remember, during this time, the child is still not generally accepted as a child or as being innately good. Our ancestors were Puritans. Childhood and education were not viewed as anything particularly positive. Children went to work as early as age seven or eight. They could crawl into the small crevices in the coal mines and into factory equipment, if it weren't for the desire of Puritan parents to have their children be able to read the Bible, we might never have had education. John Dewey, being a religious man himself, pushed the idea of education into the 20th century. He wrote a book titled Democracy and Education, which argued that education was growth. He insisted that America would never be a democratic society without education, and this definitely struck a nerve with Americans so let's educate our children but what is the best way hmm enter the era of psychology and animal research reward and punishment pavlo's dog we still ascribe to some of pavlo's theories today 
B.F. Skinner is also considered a behaviorist. According to Skinner, all behavior is learned and can be shaped or modified. Interestingly enough, Skinner was not an advocate of punishment, but many people do interpret his theory as either reward or punishment. Most of us have encountered children that are reinforced when we punish them. They wanted our attention, and when they misbehaved, we gave them their attention, so they continue to misbehave. Research-wise, the study of children and their development is just beginning. What's happening in the real world? Marie Montessori is making her mark. The nature-nurture conflict is real. What influences a child, genes or environment? Maria was a loud advocate for the nurture side, the environment. She thought, had monu she thought the environment had monumental influences on the child. Change the environment and you can change a person, she was quoted as saying. She was also convinced that any child could be educated given the right environment. Patty Smith Hall was the um, founder of the National Association for the Education of Young Children. By 1930, early childhood is indeed slowly becoming a field into its own. Uh, Patty Smith Hill was a professor at Columbia. Now remember, this is a time when a woman's place is in the home. So being a professor at an Ivory League school was a very big deal. She opened a lab school while she was there, which was also a new concept. She called a conference, which was the beginning of the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And lastly, she is the one credited with having written the Happy Birthday song that we sing on our birthdays. Before we zip through time to a less pleasant time in American history, I thought you might enjoy this coloring page that I found by doing my research. The, the world of high living didn't last long. World War I ends in 1918 and World War II starts in 1939. How does this affect early childhood? Research stops completely. But child care centers come into their own. World War II quickly became a woman's war as well. Every available man is summoned to serve, so women are left behind to run the factories and businesses. As can be expected, we step up to the challenge. Women, though, are concerned about their children, so the government says, no problem. We will set up child care centers, and your children will be well taken care of. The Works Progress Administration, WPI for short, was a document, government program established to take care of women and children during World War II. They met the challenge 150%. These were some of the best child care centers that ever existed. Men return, the war ends, men return to the universities and start research again. Albert Bandurel and his social learning theory introduces the concept of learning by imitation and observation, concepts we pretty much take for granted today. If you've never heard of Jean Piaget, take some time and get to know him. You will encounter him again and again in the early childhood field. He's the man, often we call him the grandfather of cognitive development. Much of what we do in our classroom is based on Piaget's research. Hands-on learning, open-ended questions, stages of development, children constructing their own knowledge. Lou Vygotsky has appeared since his death uh, because his Russian writings were not translated until the early 60s. We do group him with Piaget because he was a constructivist. He believed that children construct their own knowledge. He, though, is noted for the concepts of zone of proximal development, ZPD, and scaffolding, which we'll talk more about. Eric Erickson, yes, he created his own name, was a psychosocial uh, theorist and developed stages. Mary Ainsworth, these are all the people that are presently uh, in the research field. We'll talk a little bit more about them uh, later on in the course. All righty, we've come a long way, maybe too far. We're hearing cries of getting back to basics, standards, testing, our universal pre-K programs demand that we teach letters and numbers, which sometimes do not seem developmentally appropriate. 
we keep hearing that our children need to be tested to go on. So all issues we need to consider, all issues.